So this morning we continue our series that we've been calling Mad Christianity. The Mad stands for Make a Difference. And one of the things that uh, each of us need to remember as we go through this series is the fact that uh, it's not enough to look like a Christian. You know, there's the old saying of if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Well, if it looks like a Christian but it doesn't act like a Christian, then maybe it's not. And so this morning uh, we're going to continue that series and we're going to be looking at James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. And uh, I'll ask you to stand together as we read God's Word together and, and invite you to uh, follow along either in your personal Bible, uh, in a pew Bible if you want. It's, uh, the page number is up there on the screen. Or if you want, you uh, are more than welcome to just listen as I read, along, read the Scripture to us. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Such faith, can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is that? In the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe there is one God. <laughs> Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man. Do what evidence do do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And scripture was fulfilled that says God believe, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see, that person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we pray now that I pray now that as we come to this time of our our service, that you would open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us this morning. Lord, I pray that the uh, meditation of my heart and the uh, words of my mouth would be pleasing and satisfying to you and encouragement to us as we go forth from this place. May we sense, Father, uh, your spirit in our lives. In your name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. One of the things that we need to realize, one of the things that James talks about in this passage is that uh, having a mad, being a mad Christian, being a Christian that makes a difference means that we have a faith that benefits everybody, everyone around us. And the, the reality of it is, is if we're not making a difference in our world, then, then what James is really saying here is that he's questioning our faith. He's questioning where we stand with Christ. Um, and, and that's a, a pretty steep, steep order. Um, but, you know, sometimes we have things that we just don't really realize what we have in Jesus. Um, reminded of a story I had uh, a friend in college that um, told me the story. His brother uh, had a friend in Iowa that... Um, was looking through the local paper, and he just happened to see uh, a pic, uh, an ad, and it was very simple. It just said, for sale, 1953 Chevy, and a phone number. He wasn't particularly interested in it, but it caught his eye. And a couple weeks later, he noticed that that ad was still in there. And so he thought, well, I'll give it a call. And like I say, he had no interest in a 1953 Chevy, but he called the number and a very sweet little old lady answered the phone and said, yeah, she said, I, I have this car out here. Um, you can come and look at it if you want. So I thought, well, why not? I'll, I'll go take a look at it. So he drove out to the farm where she lived and she invited him in. And this was back in the early seventies. And she was kind of the stereotypical, you know, farm mom invited him in for some coffee and for some pie. And they were talking a little bit and she in the process of things told a little bit about her life story she and her husband had only had one son and uh, shortly after high school he joined the army and was shipped off to Korea and he never came back but before he left he bought himself a car and they put it in the shed and 
waited for him to come back. And obviously after he passed away, the car just kind of sat there. And she said, now my husband has passed away a couple of years ago and, and I'm probably going to need to leave the farm. And I completely forgot about the car, but I thought maybe I should, should sell it. So I've asked some friends around and they said, yeah, I should sell it. And uh, the guy said, well, yeah, I'll, I'll go down and take a look at it, you know, and, you know, to see what it's like. And so they went down to the shed, opened up the shed, and there was a car underneath this tarp, and they pulled the tarp away. And underneath the tarp was a 1954 Corvette with 350 miles on it. And his heart sank because he knew he would never be able to afford that car. But he asked the question, so how much do you want for it? And she said, well, I've asked my friends what a 1953 Chevy would be worth, and they said probably about $350. So that would be what I'd like to have for it. He took his checkbook out right now, wrote out a check for $350, bought the car, drove it into town, and had it appraised at around 10000 between ten and $20,000 for that car back in the 70s. Now, the one thing to to let you know is that he did go back to the lady and offer her more money for it, but she wouldn't take it. But you know, whether that story is true or not, I think it says something about our faith because I think sometimes we have this faith in Jesus and we don't really realize what that means, what we really have in Jesus because everything is about him. You know, back in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And after he had gotten done hanging the stars in place, and after he had gotten done with the galaxies, and after he had gotten done creating this perfect world in which uh, the, the environment was perfect for growth, and he created all of the animals, he created his masterpiece. He created man. He got down on his knees in, in the dirt and the dust and, and created man. And that was his masterpiece. And as he and the man grew closer together and as they re had a relationship together and they, they talked and he explained all of the things about creation to this man, he noticed something. He noticed that man was lonely. In fact, the only time in the Bible where God, in the creation story, where God says it was not good is when he saw the fact that man was lonely. And so one day he, he came to man and he said, Adam, I, I've, I've made a decision. I'm, I'm going to make a mate for you. And this person is going to be someone that hangs on every word you say. Someone that's going to serve you and encourage you. Someone that will lift you up and, 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 and be just the perfect person to help you feel good about everything. This person will be the one person that you can count on to always be there for you, to lift you up and make you feel good. And Adam said, wow, that's pretty good. So, and God says, so I'm going to need to have you go to sleep, and then when you wake up, this person will be there. And Adam says, well, that's great. And then God says, oh, one more thing. <clears throat> It's going to cost you an arm and a leg. And Adam thought for a minute and he said, what can I get for a rib? And the rest is history. You guys were hanging so well on that picture. It was just fun watching everybody slept, get sucked into that. Reality is, though, what we need to realize with all of that is man failed. And God had this dilemma where this one person, his creation, the one person that was the most, or creation, the, the one thing he created that was the most important to him, he could no longer have fellowship with. And that's why he sent Jesus. He sent Jesus because he realized that we of ourselves would never be able to match up to what he, need, what he needed for us to match up to. And, and he sent Jesus to show us what it was like to be God, to show us what the Father was like, and then to die for us so that we could experience once again the relationship that we missed out on because of our sin. That's the salvation story, but it goes so much farther than that because then what he asks us to do is we become his ambassadors. We become the shining light that shows other people what Jesus is like. So when you walk down the street, other people see you and they know what Jesus is like because of the way you walk, because of the way you talk, because of your actions, 
Because of how you react to life's difficulties, they look at you and they see Jesus. That's what faith is about. Each of us needs to realize we've got that 1954 Corvette in us, that treasured possession, and that's what we are like to God. The problem is that we have kind of, uh, in a sense, the church has kind of come to the point where we, we look at faith and we look at works and we think that they go together, that they, or that you, know, you have to have one or the other. And uh, this happened shortly after, the, after Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, that there were two camps that developed within the church. There was one camp that said that, that you had to learn to, uh, to get close to God by doing all kinds of things that your faith was really dead unless you did works. And there was another camp that said, no, no, it's not about works. It's about faith. It's about, you know, just believing in God. And, that, and this argument has really gone on until today. There's still some people that say that. In fact, one of the reasons this particular passage of Scripture uh, is one of the reasons that a lot of people think that the Bible contradicts itself. Because you have two camps. You have James and you have Paul. You have James, who was the half-brother of Jesus, the writer of this book, who was in Jerusalem. He was the leader of the church at that time. And you have him writing something like he did this uh, in our passage this morning, which says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? And he goes on, as we read this morning, to uh, give an example. He says, What, is, what about if there's somebody in your, your fellow someone that you know that has physical needs and you look at them and you say you know God be with you go your way but you do nothing for them of what value is that what kind of faith is that that you watch somebody a brother and sister in Christ or, or even someone that's not a brother and sister in Christ that's struggling in life and you say wow that's really a bummer you know I'm going to pray for you you go and have a great day I remember one time I stopped at McDonald's and I stopped just for my cup of coffee, of course, and I gave the young lady in the window the, the change and, and, uh, or the, the payment, and there was change coming, so she handed me the change, but in the process of handing me the change, one of the coins fell between the window and my car onto the ground. And it was kind of funny because obviously she had not been trained in what to do in a situation like that because she looked at me, her face got white, and she just kind of, have a good day, and shut the window. <laughs> yeah, thanks. It was only a penny. I let the next guy have it. But that's sometimes what we do in the church, isn't it? We look at all the struggles that people have, and we say, have a good day, I'll pray for you, and we go our way, and we don't do anything. And, and James says, what kind of faith is that? But then you have another guy named Paul. And Paul writes in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, a very common verse to us, which says, is, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. So you have two camps of Christians that say, wait a minute, the Bible must contradict itself, because James is saying that if you don't have faith and works, your faith is dead. And Paul is saying, no, you don't need works. All you need is faith. And so they look at this and they say, well, it's obviously the Bible contradicts itself. If it contradicts itself here, it must contradict itself other places. And that sounds like a great argument until you start looking into what's really being said here. And so what we need to do is we need to look at the context and who, who's writing to who. For example, when James is writing this passage, when he writes and says, what good is faith without works? He's writing to the church. He's writing to us. And what he's really saying is, okay, you've got the faith, but if you don't have any works, it's worthless. He's not saying that you don't, you're not saved. He's not saying that, that if you don't do work, you're going to go to hell. What he's simply saying is the faith that you have, you've got this Corvette in your shed that you're not using. And then of what good is it? Paul, on the other hand, is writing to a bunch of people that came out of a pagan type of religion. He was writing to new Christians that were Gentiles that had been involved in religions that demanded that they do certain things in order to appease the gods. 
Do you realize that Christianity is the only religion in the entire world where there is no list of things you have to do in order to get appeased, be appeased with God? All you have to do is believe. So Paul's writing to a bunch of people that are saying, okay, what do I have to do? What do I have to do to be saved? And Paul says, believe in Jesus. Okay, good, but what do I have to do? What things do I have to do? And Paul says, nothing. Once you accept Jesus into your heart, you're good. You don't have to do anything more. And we have a lot of Christians that are the same way as we think, okay, I've accepted Jesus, but now what more do I have to do? What other things do I have to do to be right with God? And we have some people out there that are more than willing to give you a list of rules, of do's and don'ts. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. You know, even coming to church or coming to, or having Bible study or prayer, those are all things that are important in your Christian growth. But they're not important in your salvation because your salvation comes through faith. So this argument went on back and forth between that. Um, what we need to realize is that religion tells us about a bunch of things to do, but our faith is what's really um, important. It'd be sort of, let me, let me try to explain it another way. Let's just say, for example, that I went to the doctor for my annual physical, and the doctor said I needed to lose 30 pounds. Actually, he said 40 pounds, but I'm just going to say 30 pounds. And, because it's easier for me to deal with that. And he says, you need to watch your diet, and you need to start running. Okay, so you watch your diet and you start running, but about the third or fourth day that you're out there running, you hit a hole, you fall, and you break your ankle. You go back to the doctor, you get a cast on it, and the doctor says, stay off your foot for a few days. And you say, wait a minute, doctor, you're contradicting yourself. You told me that I was supposed to run. Now you're telling me not to run. There's a contradiction there. Well, no, there's not a contradiction there, is there? At this point in my life, because I messed up my ankle, I need to take it easy. And that's kind of what the difference between what James and, and Paul are talking about is we have our faith, is ground, our, our salvation is grounded in our faith. But the works part just makes, us, uh, makes our faith more uh, valuable, more um, important to other people. I completely lost the word that I wanted there. Anyway, uh, the other thing that Paul said, or uh, James writes is he says, you know, you say you have faith, I have deeds. Uh, show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there is one God, even the demons believe that and shudder. And what he's really saying there to people that uh, say, well, you know, it's all about just believing in God. I don't have to do anything more than that. And he's saying, good for you. Satan believes in God too. So you're right there with Satan. Well, we don't want to be that. We want to be above that. We want to be working towards it. So what I want to share with you this morning is, first of all, what you need to realize that a living kind of faith is a verb. It's an action word. We need to be active in our faith. And what that means is, first of all, personally, I think, is to be, um, be involved in reading God's word. This better not be your only Jesus fix for the week. There should be times when you're in the Word, uh, you're praying, you're looking at what God wants from you. But the other thing that you need to realize is that living faith is also a choice. It's a choice that you make. It's a choice you make personally. It's a choice that we make as a, a fellowship. You, know, you choose to live a life in which other people are going to look at you and, and be drawn to you. I, one of the things I thought about is, you know, individually, what do I look at? Look, how do I look to other people? Do when other people see me, do I do they see Jesus in me? Do the actions that I take are the actions that I take purely for my own benefit, or are they for the benefit of others? What can I do in my life to make myself more Christ-like, more acceptable to other people? Not for me, but so they're drawn to Jesus, or as a fellowship thinking about us as a fellowship. Are we doing everything that we can, both facility-wise and ministry-wise, to reach out and make this place a place where people want to come, where they're comfortable to come, where they, can, where, the, where they can comfortably come and meet with each other and realize that God is here in this midst? What can we do to, change, to uh, be that way? Uh, then James gives us two examples. <clears throat> 
In uh, chapter 2, verse 23, he says, And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness because he was called God's friend. He gives us an example, and if you remember the story of Abraham, Abraham was called by God, and Abraham, uh, God said to Abraham, Okay, Abraham, I want you to pack up everything that you have because I'm moving you. And Abraham says, Good, where am I going? And God says, Never mind, you'll know when you get there. Just you're not coming back here. Pack everything up and go where I tell you to go. And Abraham went. And as he grew in God and grew closer to God, there came a point where God said, okay, Abraham, you're going to have a son. And, God ha- and Abraham had to wait for that son. When Isaac was finally born, Abraham, I want you to take your son. You're going to take him up onto the mountain and you're going to sacrifice him. Remember that story? And so Abraham goes up on the mountain with his son, who's now like probably about 40 years old. And God says, build an altar, put some wood on it, and lay your son there and sacrifice him to me. And and Abraham's an old man, but his son goes along with what dad says. And just about the time that Abraham's about ready to plunge the, the knife into Abraham's throat to sacrifice him to God, God says, stop. But Abraham had to be willing to sacrifice the most cherished possession to to God for that in order for God to know that his faith is what made him uh, made him whole and as a result of that Abraham was called God's friend and James says you see that person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone we need to add to that the adding to it doesn't make our salvation any different but it makes our walk with God different then he gives another example it says, in the same way, it was not even Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous for what she did and when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. I love the story about Rahab. And if you don't remember it, a very brief nutshell of what it was, Rahab was a prostitute in the city of Jericho. And as the Israelites came to Jericho and they were getting ready to, uh, to destroy the city as God had commanded them to do, uh, they sent a couple of spies in to spy things out. And Rahab knew who they were and she hid them so that they couldn't be found. And after the, the, uh, the uh, officials came to get the spies and, and she said they weren't there, then she sent them off a different way. And as she sent them away, she said... Um, Please uh, ask your God to protect me. And the spy said, here's what you need to do. You hang a, 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 a tapestry down from your window, and when God comes to destroy the city, he'll protect you. And so she did that, and she was saved. You know what's cool about this story? Rahab was a prostitute. She was a Gentile. She was protected by God. And if you read the genealogy of Jesus Christ, Rahab's in it. Because God could use her in spite of all of the other things that weren't what we consider nice, clean Christian stuff because of her faith. And the reason I like that story so much is because it shows me, it reminds me of the fact that God can use anybody. All we need to do is have faith and be willing to step out and act. Let me, let me uh, try to explain that to you. Um, in another way. Uh, well, first of all, before I forget, this screen is important too. Abraham took a risk, but his risk was based on what he knew. He had walked with God. He knew what God was like. Rahab took a risk as well because she took a risk of faith in everything uh, that she hoped for, but she didn't know for sure it would be true. So anyway, let me explain that in another way. Try and explain it a little bit different. This is kind of a cool picture. It's one of my favorite pictures. A little background to this story. Now, back in 2008, I, uh, well, Trish and I and the girls were in Play the Carol. I was Bob Cratchit. She was one of the uh, solicitors. And uh, in the particular scene, the solicitors come into Scrooge, and uh, he sends them away. And uh, one particular night, you can't see it real well in the picture, but in her hand that's right in, in between my two hands, there's a ring box. And we'd been dating for about uh, six years, and we're talking about, you know, someday we should get married. And um, so that night, things went a little bit differently in the play, because as the solicitors were getting ready to leave, I stepped out from behind my desk, and I pulled her aside, and I asked if she'd marry me. 
And she said yes. It was really kind of cool because my our friend Kevin was the director and he had just happened to have everybody sitting in there for that event. And uh, it was really pretty cool. It's one of my favorite pictures because I really surprised her a lot. But you know what happened after that? We got married and things changed for both of us. All of a sudden, a lot of things that I used to do, and they weren't bad things, but a lot of things that I used to do weren't important. They were good things, but what really became important was my relationship with her. And we talked about this. It's mutual, which is always a good thing. Because our focus began to be not about just ourselves and making our own life what it needed to be, but to work together to make our lives one and to be unified. Now, why do I bring that picture up? Because I think sometimes we need to say yes to Jesus. I think there's a lot of times when a lot of us have been dating Jesus for a long time. You know what I mean by that? We've been doing the church thing. Maybe we even read the Bible occasionally. Uh, we, we've gotten the whole confirmation thing done. We've done the baptism thing. Uh, we attend church when we can. We do all of these things in this kind of a dating relationship. But maybe it's time for you to get married. Maybe it's time for you to decide, you know what? I, I'm, I'm not happy being just me. I want to be united with Christ. I want all of my focus to change from being just about me to being about him and about his body and about the body of Christ and what we can do. I think sometimes we need to say yes to Jesus. Uh, when Jesus was uh, just closing up his ministry on earth and uh, he's talking to the disciples, some of the last words he says, he says, I've set an example to you that you should do as I've done for you. Verily, verily, very truly I say to you, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. What Jesus is saying to his disciples and what he's saying to us, I think, is this. And, and I think it's what James is saying too in this last part of the chapter 2, is he's saying this, you've seen me. You know, he's talking to the disciples that have been with him for 24-7 for the last three years. They watched how Jesus reacted to the woman caught in adultery. They watched how Jesus reacted to the, the, um, the Pharisees. They watched how Jesus reacted to those that were deaf. They watched how Jesus reacted to the down and out. They watched him feed the hungry. They watched him heal the lame. They watched him encourage those that were down, downcast and discouraged. And then he says, Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. You remember back in, I think it was the 90s, there was that marketing ploy thing uh, called What Would Jesus Do, the WWJD, which, you know, sounds like a really cool spiritual thing. I think mostly it was just somebody had a cool marketing thing where they should, could sell bracelets and T-shirts and things like that. But the reality is there's a lot there to that. What would Jesus do if he was sitting in a restaurant where the service was really, really bad? How would he react to the waitress? What would Jesus do if he's driving down the road and some guy comes and cuts him off? We, were, we went to Eau Claire, Chippewa yesterday, and we kind of got the feeling that apparently if you have a uh, pickup with, that's really jacked up, you can do whatever you want on the road. I mean, man, <laughs> there's... It, how do you react to that? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do in a family situation when somebody's not pulling their weight? Or at work when someone's not doing what they should do? What would Jesus do? That's what a living faith is about. It's about being the way Christ would want us to be because we become the example. We become the shining light for other people. My encouragement to us as we close this morning is that we have a living faith. That we do the things that we need to do to realize that we set aside ourselves. And that we do, that we put feet to our actions. I was talking to somebody this last week about this. And he's going through some really, really tough stuff right now. And he said, you know, he said, I've come to the realization, he said, the most important thing that I can do is just walk the walk. And talk the talk. 
you can tell people about Jesus, but there's another cliche, and it's way overused, but I'll use it anyway, which is people would rather see a sermon than hear one every day, any day. Are you being the kind of person that will draw other people to Jesus Christ? That's what a living faith is. Let's stand together as we close. Praise team, if you'd come up, uh, we'll close with one last song. And as we come to prayer, it's, as we come to closing this morning, my encouragement, like I say to us, is that we go from this place learning what it means to have an active and a living faith. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I pray for my brothers and sisters here in the room this morning. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you would help us to have a real understanding of who we are. And then because of that, because of that cherished possession we are of yours, that we would be able to be a, a shining light, a shining example to those around us. Help us as individuals to be the kind of person that draws people to you. Help us as a fellowship, as a church body, to do whatever we need to do here with this building, with this, uh, these facilities, this ministry, to make this place a place where other people, people will feel comfortable and to feel uh, drawn to you. And I pray these things in your name. Amen.